Welcome everyone, friends, family, orchestra members, uh, to another one of our uh, panelist discussions. A very topical uh, item we're going to talk about today is uh, copyrights, license fees, and the effect on diversity of music that we have accessible to us. Now, I want to say right up front two very important things. And the first is that the uh, Civic Orchestra of Jacksonville is committed to respecting copyright laws. As we plan our performances, we look very carefully at the selections we consider to ensure that we have the right to perform them. And the second important thing that I want to say is that none of us are copyright attorneys. We are musicians trying to abide by the laws. So this will be a very practical discussion about copyrights and exactly how we work to ensure that we are compliant. Our panelists are four very distinguished folks uh, who I enjoy very much. Uh, Dr. Marguerite Richardson, hi Marguerite, who is the conductor of the Civic Orchestra of Jacksonville and among other many prestigious professional activities, she is professor of strings at Jacksonville University and therefore Marguerite has much valuable experience to share regarding respect and copyright laws. Our next panelist is Kara Hooker. Hi Kara. Hello. Uh, Kara is the Civic Orchestra's music librarian, and among her responsibilities is ensuring that we have the proper copyright licenses to copy, perform, record, and post the music that we select. And whenever possible, she's also working to build the orchestra's library for future performances. Kara currently teaches music at Atlantic Beach Elementary, and she's involved in the Civic Orchestra's educational outreach and lesson, lesson planning programs. Thank you, Kara. Julie, Julie, hi. Hi there. Julie Badger is an accomplished flute player and has played with the Civic Orchestra since its inception in 2016. Julie was featured as a soloist back in our inaugural year, and she was playing Cheminade's Flute Concertino, which is a very famous piece I think you're probably familiar with, and you can find Julie's performance on YouTube. Uh, Julie was a high school music teacher and band director, as well as a performer, and so has practical experience around respecting copyright laws. Anne McKinnon. Hi, Anne. Hi. Anne is a professional flutist, teacher, and composer, and was Civic Orchestra's composer in residence for the 2018-19 season. The Civic Orchestra has performed Anne's arrangement of Brian Boru's March, as well as her original composition, Emergence. You can check out Anne's website as, at aemckinnon.com and also her YouTube channel, as well as our performances of Anne's work on YouTube. Anne will share with us the ways in which she manages her creative work to ensure that it is protected and respected. So before I turn to our panel, uh, I'd like to just give a little bit of practical background on copyright laws in the US because folks might not realize that they actually originated with the US Constitution and the stated purpose was to promote art and culture. Copyrights secure for the authors or composers for a limited time the exclusive right to their own original works. And these works must be recorded in some kind of physical medium, whether it's on paper or audio tape or computer disc, you know, it can't just be a tune you're humming in your head. These exclusive rights include making and selling copies of their work, creating derivative works, and performing or displaying their works publicly. Preserving such exclusive rights to authors and composers was intended to allow them to benefit economically and so support the further development of the arts. That was the intention. So although certain details in the laws have undergone modification over the years because they had to consider things like uh, how, what time period exclusive rights should really be held, how are you going to deal with technologies that did not exist at the time of the ratification of the Constitution, such as radio, records, electronic recordings, internet access, those kinds of things. Um, so this is not meant to be a discussion of the evolution of the law, but rather how it affects us in its current form. So with that as background, I'd like to turn first to Kara for a little bit more of a detailed breakdown of the copyrights in terms of the exclusive rights held by the owner. So um, let's start with the six basic rights owners have, like the actual composers themselves of the music. Um, so they can authorize others to use this in certain ways. And these are the way that they're protected. So they can decide um, how the, the content is reproduced and how many copies are made of the work or copies 
no copies at all, for example, um, to prepare derivative works based on the original work, or in other words, make arrangements, um, how they distribute the copies of the recordings of the work to any public by sale. So if the Civic Orchestra of Jacksonville recorded the performance, um, are we allowed to sell that to other people? Are we allowed to put that on a DVD um, and sell that to the public, et cetera, um, to publicly perform the work? Are we allowed to even perform it in public or is it just for us to learn ourselves and enjoy in our little space of practice? Um, and then they can also decide um, how we're going to transmit that to the public. So could it be on the radio, TV, et cetera? So Kara, how long do these rights exist for the owner of the copyright? So, for any composer that is protected by copyright laws um, until their death, then add 70 years is how long they are protected. So <laughs> essentially during this time, uh, the composer can decide whether they're gonna hold the rights and make decisions um, as discussed prior, um, or they can have uh, a third party company take ownership and kind of take those um, rules that they decided and distribute it and have people buy it from them uh, gives a little less work to the composer in general. Um, so if the composer is still living, you can ask for permission, for example, Anne McKinnon. Um, but if they are not, most of the time a company manages their content. Um, at the end of the 70 years past death, the copyright works becomes public domain. So public domain means that it's for the public's use. There are uh, no rules and regulations. You may perform it in public. You can charge for tickets. Um, you can record it and put it on the internet. No problems at all. It is public. Um, so most orchestral music that you hear these days from public domain, for the most part, is from the Baroque, classical, and romantic periods. So your favorite composers such as Bach, Handel, Mozart, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, et cetera. You hear a lot of these composers because they are public domain, they are free and they uh, give us a little room to breathe as an orchestra knowing that whatever we perform and put on the internet is A-OK. -okay. So Kara, it strikes me as you're talking that these rights seem very complete, all inclusive in terms of the control they give to the copyright owner. And for what feels like a pretty long time, 70 years after I'm gone, hmm, I might not care about what's happening to my mm -hmm. stuff, but are there any exceptions to these rights? Yes, um, there are a few exceptions and um, I've dealt with them myself as an educator. Um, so the Copyright Act provides several <laughs> exceptions to the holder's rights um, for the material. So the first one is fair use. So for example, if a student is doing any type of research or anybody, so um, criticism, commenting, news reporting, teaching, um, research in general, that's an exception. Um, teaching exemptions. So if my students want to perform a piece of music at a concert in the building um, face to face or using it as instructional purposes in my classroom, I am protected under that. Um, public performance without commercial advantage is also another uh, way that we can find this uh, protection. So Civic Orchestra of Jacksonville actually meets these requirements because we don't charge for tickets um, because we are giving these free performances with the exception that um, we don't put it on social media. We don't record it. We don't uh, put it in any type of vessels. If we kept it to just the live performances without any recordings, we would actually be protected um, under this Copyright Act. But Alas, we like to put our things online so people can hear all of our awesome concerts later in the future. Um, another one is uh, how we transmit it. So um, putting it on an apparatus such as the radio or media um, for educational purposes um, can also be protected. And then lastly, it says eligible establishment transmissions. It, it's just another layer of can I put this in the public and is it for research, educational, um, or reporting purposes? 
So Kara, since so much of the music that we play has entered the public domain, many of the pieces that we'd like to perform, I know we've need to reach out for copyright licenses. And I've, I've heard, you know, some frustration on, on at certain occasions where we request a particular license and either our request is ignored or the license turns out to be pretty expensive or frankly, the answer is just no. So that has had a, a really severely limiting effect on the orchestra's ability to perform compositions by contemporary artists, including composers of color. But to try to get around that, I've, I've learned that there exist a couple of professional organizations that we can turn to for licenses because they've already bought the rights to a broad array of music. So I'm gonna to turn to you again, Kara, to please describe the two main blanket licenses that the orchestra holds to ensure that we have the freedom to perform those compositions. Sure, so um, every single year, there are two uh, companies that we give um, a fund to and they protect us, those blanket license um, that Cindy was just talking about. And um, one of them is uh, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, or ASCAP. And then the other one is the Broadcast Music Incorporated, which is BMI. So um, those are the two main ones. I was just wondering, Kara, so when you get a license from ASCAP or BMI, do you have a full range of rights to, to copy the music, to play it, to post it, or, or are those rights somehow broken down under different... I don't know, some licensing structures, I guess I would say. So for the most part, when you are um, a member of both of those organizations, it depends on which one covers what, but um, it's either on one side or the other. And it's about 50-50. I've never been told no for us being members as part of both of them. Um, that covers the spectrum of what we're ordering. So um, when I order or look into renting or purchasing said music, it's pretty, uh, it's going to be pretty solid that we're covered on either side of those licenses, but it's imperative that we have both because if we just have one, it could be that we're not covered under that full umbrella or the spectrum of what we can um, play and be protected by. Okay. Well, what I was going to ask you was, especially with regard to our group, approximately how much do we have to pay for the licenses? Like, is there a standard amount or does it vary based on what you're wanting to, to get? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, ultimately both companies function off of what type of organization you are, what your target and purpose of your organization is. And then based on those factors, depends on how much you pay annually. So every single year we have to renew if we anticipate playing any music um, outside of the public domain, which that's our goal. We wanna reach out to all the composers, right? So um, essentially it's broken down by, there's a minimum fee, which is around 300 to $400 per organization. So we're already at the $800 mark as we speak. Um, to be protected. And then after that, they ask, um, do you sell tickets? And we don't, as a nonprofit, reaching out to the community as our goal to provide free concerts um, to Jacksonville and our surrounding areas. Um, so that uh, becomes whatever your ticket sales were, then you have to multiply that by a certain percentage if it, if it exists. So, I mean, for because we're nonprofit, like we definitely benefit from this because, you know, we we're not getting ticket sales, but we have 500 people who attend our concerts on average. Can you imagine if we charged a dollar per those 500 people? We do four concerts on average per year um, on the usual. So, I mean, we're talking 2000 tickets ballpark range um, multiplied mm -hmm. by that percentage would be attached on top of that 300 to $400 minimum and annually in, um, I mean, in, in the, the greater ballpark range, I mean, we would, we would be paying upwards of, you know, 5,000 to $10,000, I would argue for the amount of people who attend our concerts. So long story short, um, we pay the minimum fee because we don't charge for tickets and it 100% depends on, um, do you charge for tickets? 
how many concerts do you do a year, et cetera. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. I, that That's interesting to me. Uh, and, and I also wondered how broad of a base of music is available under those two organizations, ASCAP and BMI for the licenses. And how do you go about checking to see if a piece of music is covered? Uh, so most of the music is covered under those two umbrellas as stated before. Um, the yeah. biggest difference is there are so many companies who hold um, these licenses for the set composers. So um, there are third parties that we use and websites that we use who kind of do, they're the middleman. They do the talking between the companies that um, house these composers works. Um, I, I usually have to do a search engine and I have to get a quote and inquire for the pieces that are newer, that are not public domain because they are uh, rentals for the most part. Um, usually we can't own them. And if we can purchase them, it's upwards of 500 to a thousand dollars on average for us to own said contemporary pieces. Um, but for the most part, we are renting them, which they just give us a time frame for when we're going to perform the concert. We get it a little bit beforehand, so we may rehearse with um, the music and then I have to return it back. Um, but the third party is helpful in a way because I don't have to dig so hard to see what um, company has this particular piece um, available to rent from. So they kind of do the work there. The frustrating part is that there is no time frame on when you get this information back. Um, it's not super consistent. Um, the, the prices can vary from the quote and um, that quote changes based on, are you using this in a recording? Um, are you going to be putting this on the internet? Are you going to be um, just using this in any other way that's outside of that live performance? Um, and your quote changes, uh, you can add 300 to $400 on your quote if you just wanna put it on YouTube. And that's just for one piece that we do for one concert. So it really adds up quite quickly um, in terms of how much money we can spend. Um, and then lastly, when we do complete set concerts under the ASCAP and BMI licenses, it's our responsibility to, um, as we return the music, we're responsible for returning um, our programs included. Um, so they know when the piece was performed and what movements were performed exactly just to give um, the composers their um, royalties. So they, they know that we're protected. There's documentation. Um, it's a long process. It <laughs> so <sounds like> it. <laughs> it does sound like it. I didn't realize what a monumental task. I knew it was a big job, but that is really a lot to have to go over and to check into just to protect all of us. Um, so I don't think we have thanked you nearly enough <laughs> for what you do for the orchestra. Well, thank you. It was a learning process and um, I'm definitely a little bit more in tune with uh, what needs to happen to make sure that we're protected. And um, obviously Marguerite was a big help with that throughout the process because she's a champ when it comes to the experience in that realm, so. Yeah. I'm sure, but oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Sure. I think the whole orchestra has a new appreciation for you, Kara. Yes, definitely. So Marguerite, I wanna bring you into this discussion. Um, you mentioned that when we were preparing this a week or so ago that the university holds these blanket licenses from ASCAP and BMI as well. But I'm wondering, does, your, does the teaching exemption apply to your lessons and perhaps your students' recitals? Um, not really. Hmm. Um, it would depend. Um, if you've purchased music, even if it's um, not public domain yet, like there's some Stravinsky pieces and things that would have been composed past the, the 1923, they tend to be very expensive to buy. Uh, but the problem is, theoretically, they're, they're not public domain as far as the like putting them on the internet. Um, I personally have not had a student ever tell me that if they posted their recital, uh, they got told to take anything down. I suppose that's possible. Um, I know a lot of times with fair use 
um, you get a certain amount of time or a certain percentage of a piece you're allowed to use on the internet or um, uh, to broadcast or whatever. But um, uh, as far as being able to put the whole thing out there, uh, certainly not mostly when we deal with this, we're dealing with, for me personally, is the orchestra at JU's very similar to what Carrie's going to be dealing with with the, the civic orchestra is filling out these forms. Um, the, the third party that I use usually is Zinfonia. Um, I'm, yeah, so with Zinfonia, uh, it's like a clearinghouse. You put, you put that all that information, but they want everything. It's so much detail. And um, the scary thing is you have to put all your addresses, like everything, and you want to keep writing, but I'm only asking for a quotation. I'm always <laughs> terrified I'm going to, you know, find a package of music um, only to, you know, to have later found out that I couldn't afford to rent it. Um, and it is amazing. Every one of those details has a, some kind of a price point attached to it, especially the selling of tickets. Um, is it going to be on the internet? Um, is it going to be live streamed? And of course, right now in the world of universities, um, you know, JU is one of the rare exception universities whose, whose university orchestra is still uh, rehearsing, meeting face to face. I mean, yes, we're distanced. Yes, we're masked. Yes, we have to take very long breaks so that the stage air can clear because our stage, um, uh, our concert hall has like the highest, you know, rate of, of air replacement, like the, the required amount. Um, we had to have every room where music takes place out on campus uh, assessed for that what the you know the return is what's the replacement rate um and and fortunately our concert all passed and had had a very high rate but we still have to break instead of for 10 or 15 minutes in the middle of a rehearsal we have to take a 30 minute break so if you look at a rehearsal that's two and a half hours long you're mm -hmm. already looking at an hour of that time now has been lost to taking a break uh, which most of the students don't really want to do, but we, we have to do it. We're required to do it. Um, so most orchestras now are trying to do some live streaming. If, if you're still playing, you want to live stream it because limited audience space in addition to limited orchestra members. Mm -hmm. And I'm amazed um, talking to my colleagues across the country. So many of them are suffering because they, you know, when we all do our budgets, we might have accounted for renting the music, but the renting or the extra fees that are incurred to broadcast or, you know, live stream it, um, just for one piece that I'm doing on my next concert here at the university, just for the right to have it live stream one, like live, the one concert, not to put it up online. I mean, we'll, we usually leave our concerts up that one piece will have to be removed from the video before it, it goes online. Only the public domain things will be allowed. Uh, but just to have that one performance of a 23 minute piece was $200 just for that one streaming. And mm -hmm. you know, when you, when you look at university budgets right now, which you know, every, every school is, is struggling a little bit, um, especially with students living on campus this is national. This is a national sort of crisis for community orchestras like the civic orchestra and university orchestras, um, because these are fees and things that we never had to anticipate. So it, it definitely affects programming and it, it, it definitely affects budgeting. Um, of course, we're all hoping fingers, everything crossed that going forward in the fall, uh, we're going to be sort of back to normal. But um, I think though live streaming has become so popular and whereas you might have 100, 150, 200 people attend a concert and then you put a live stream out and you see that four or 500 viewed it, you know, you're, you're reaching an audience. So it's, I think that it's, I don't want to say it's the wave of the future because so many schools have, have been doing this, but I think schools that, and, and organizations that never would have gone down that path are now going to need to think about going down that path just to reach more people. Um, I mean, to me, it's sort of a win-win for orchestral music, for classical music in general, just to get more people viewing and certainly getting more contemporary works. Uh, when we say contemporary now, 
uh, you're talking about since 1923, you're talking about almost 100 years of music that if we want to perform, um, but that's a lot of music that is kind of off limits unless we're able to have funding to do that kind of programming. As far as copyright is concerned in your work there at the university, how approximately how often would you say you run into copyright issues um, in terms of maybe a license not being available? Generally speaking, and, and probably because I'm tending to do uh, standard contemporary or standard copyrighted works, I have not run into a situation yet where I was denied a license. I know that a lot of times you will get a performance license, you will get the um, maybe the streaming license, but you might be denied the mechanical license, which would be actually pressing it into a, a CD or some kind of a, a commercial um, uh, presentation. But, uh, and, and it's fascinating to hear, you know, I hear all these terms, but like mechanical license comes from the fact that they used to have to actually use a machine to produce records. So that pressing of, the, of that has turned, now, now mechanical, there's nothing <laughs> mechanical going on, but right. the, the name kind of stuck. So it's any kind of reproduction, digital now, of course. Um, but, and I've been told that a lot of times those will be denied. Um, but generally the recording um, licenses aren't. So for at a university level, for example, you're better off trying to produce a CD than perhaps a DVD because the, the CD is just audio and they're completely different rules for whether or not it's just audio and whether or not it's going to be video. <laughs> so, and I mean, it, it really is. Um, I saw a, a whole session on this at a conference not long ago and um, again, the, the person who was doing it is a conductor. And he said, you know, it's not like I took a class on this. I had to learn all of this this year mm -hmm. because we're all trying to, um, if, if our students are performing, we want to, to get their performances out there. Um, so it's, it's, I'm fortunate that I haven't had anything declined. To piggyback off of that, um, I would say that we're, you're never really uh, declined licenses in terms of performing. It's really, it comes down to the monetary. Do you have the money? Can you pay for the music? Can you pay for the rental? Can you pay for adding it onto the internet, et cetera? Um, like you just said with the CD and DVDs, totally, they, they'll deny that sometimes because a recording of a performance is a whole nother ball game. But overall, it has to deal with that monetary. How has this impacted our group, the Civic Orchestra, if at all? Um, I think it has certainly when we, you know, we try to do as many um, sort of cohesive themed programs as we can. Um, not too long ago, we did the one on ex exploration and mm -hmm. we went everything from exploring the stars and we did music from uh, Hulse the Planets. Well, Hulse lived 100, over a hundred years ago. So that music is available free off on the internet or you can purchase it. I mean, it's, it's available for purchase or ownership. So you don't have to rent it. Um, but there was a piece that I had discovered when I was in high school. Um, I was in an orchestra that played it and I was fascinated by it um, called And God Created Great Whales written by Alan Havanis, which incorporated the sound of living whales, um, like their song into the music. And of course, when I explained this to our president, Nadine Turk, she was like, oh, we absolutely have to do this. And at the time I warned her, it's like, this is going to be rental. And you not only have to rent the, um, the music, but you'll have to, you know, it comes with like a sound file, an audio file of the whales. So that had technical issues uh, for performance, but it also did cost a pretty reasonable amount, as I remember, um, in order to do that. So, you know, for, we were very fortunate that at that time we had the resource to be able to rent it. But sometimes, you know, and it was a pretty long piece, fairly mm -hmm. long piece, which is, which is good. Sometimes I'll look at something that's rental and it will be four or $500 for a five or six minute piece. And honestly, I can't justify that. That's, that's such a large piece of budget to mm -hmm. me for such a small amount of time. Uh, if mm -hmm. I spend four or five hundred dollars 
for a symphony that's going to be a, a 30 or 35, 40 minute piece on the program, the main work. Yes, I think that's, you know, that's reasonable. And certainly if it helps me uh, represent an underrepresented composer. Um, but uh, it, it definitely affects civic in that certainly a percentage of our programs have to be public domain. And sometimes because the theme is a certain theme, you, it's a little bit of a stretch sometimes to come up with a, a full hour of music that is going to support the theme that we're trying to present to the public, but um, is also all written for 1923. Um, so that, you know, it, it definitely affects it. Um, I will say that's certainly a, a good, a good um, impetus for us to do things like Ant's pieces, to do commissions and to do, mm -hmm. um, you know, premieres of works because mm -hmm. that, you know, that be can become a win-win for the composer. It gets the composer's works out there um, and they can give us verbal permission. Um, I don't think you had to do a written permission, but a verbal mm -hmm. permission to do it and to be able to put it out there on the, on the, like our YouTube channel. So, and that's a great way to um, play contemporary works, um, sort of sidebar at the university here, we do a lot of faculty and student compositions, sort of for the same reason, it helps them get recordings of their works, but it also um, helps me have the students play contemporary works um, that I am not having to rent. Um, so it, again, it's that it's that win-win kind of thing where they might get a technique or something that is a little different from Beethoven, like you know, a different kind of, of plucking the string or flutter tonguing or into percussion. A couple of years ago, they had to twirl aerophones. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it gives them a very different flavor of music from from what we can get from the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries um, without having to do the the rental, but then sometimes, you know, somebody like Stravinsky's the Firebird was written in 1919. You can buy that. Uh, and actually, we okay. actually, the university here already owns that. Um, but you want to do something like the Danse Contretemps, which is for string orchestra was written after that. So it's not even by composer. It's that it's that hard date. You know, and that's why every every orchestra on the planet does Firebird, but not that many people are going to do something like Rite of Spring because you have to rent that. So, okay. so it definitely affects it definitely affects civics programming. Well, if the ovation that we received after playing that piece about the whales is any indication, that definitely was a worthwhile rental. Yes, and they seem funny. to love it. I I even remember. I mean, I remember the impact it had on me. So mm -hmm. that was one that, I mean, I've always wanted to conduct it. So it was a win-win for me, win -win, uh, yeah. uh, but, but something like that. And so you really have to weigh the, the cost, you know, mm -hmm. is it really going to give us, is that impact on mm -hmm. the audience going to be there? And I mean, yes, I would say that it, it was, it's, it's it, it definitely was. Now hopefully everyone who's watching this will now go to our YouTube channel and find it because it will change your life. <laughs> yes. It was fun to play too. Mm -hmm. yes. I'll make sure I post those details at the end Thank of the video. Thank you. Yes. Yes. But uh, that was a great segue for me, Marguerite, because I did want to turn to Anne next because Anne, as a, as a composer, a, a professional musician trying to make a living, what process do you use to protect your work? So do you belong to ASCAP or BMI as a member and you contribute your work to them for them to publish? Okay. Yes, I am a member of ASCAP. That's how performers, how composers get performance royalties. And ASCAP does not sell the works. They just collect the royalties to pay. It costs $50 to join ASCAP as a creator. It costs another $50 if you want to join as a publisher, and self-publishers would do both. I currently have about 15 pieces registered with them. There is no additional cost every time I need to register a new work. So that's good. <laughs> um, as for copyright protection, I register all my works with the US Copyright Office. It costs $85 to register up to 10 works at one time. So it really pays to do it in bulk, but it depends on how many pieces I have ready to be registered. 
um, without that registration, you have no recourse against copyright infringement. So you don't have to register your works if you want to roll the dice. But if you ever have somebody infringe upon your copyright and you need to take action, you have no choice. To earn money for sheet music sales, that's where publishing goes in. I have two pieces, two duets with Falls House Press. So for those two pieces, Falls House owns the copyright, so they make all the decisions. In exchange, I get 10% royalties on sheet music sales. The rest of my work, I self-publish through sheetmusicplus.com, and I do that as a PDF download, so the purchaser has to do all the printing themselves. But that arrangement allows me to keep my copyright. I still own everything. I still make all of my decisions. I create all the files. I set the prices. I write the descriptions, but they handle all the rest. They do all the financial transactions. They handle the sales tax. They deal with the PDF delivery. I don't have to manage any of that. And in exchange, I get 45% of the sales and the decisions are all mine. I can cancel it at any time and there is no charge for me to do this. Um, I've chosen to take this Sheet Music Press PDF download route instead of forming my own publishing company because there is a limit to how much time I want to spend running a business, managing my existing works instead of creating new works and practicing and maybe having dinner with my husband. So I use my website I use YouTube and social media for marketing. I regularly refresh the descriptions on Sheet Music Press. And sometimes I even update the pieces themselves. I always find tweaks that I have to make after a piece gets performed. And those tweaks can be very minor, but imagine I have to change the bowing on a large ensemble piece. That affects the score, which is in multiple sizes. That affects all of the string parts. And then I have to put it all together and get it out there. So it, it, all of that takes a lot of time and energy, and that's quite enough. I'm not going to add publishing company on top of that. Copyright protection is absolutely necessary, and I am grateful for it. But the fact that it covers 70 years after my lifetime is problematic. Once I'm dead, I can't sell scores. I cannot authorize licenses. I can't do anything and it will become illegal for anybody else to do it. By the time the work becomes public domain, I've been gone for 70 years, my music will be as dead as I am. So the only chance of my music surviving is A, publishing company, those pieces will survive, or B, if I manage to get it into public domain upon my death. I was wondering when you were teaching, when you were leading the marching band folks, did you feel a limitation on what you could use for for your students for your for your bands were you made aware of copyrights um, or what did the school sort of protect you from that and just kind of give you what you could play with them I don't think the school really got involved that much with it let me let me first preface any of this by saying that unlike the rest of the panel I was teaching some uh, uh, roughly 40 years ago so that's a lot longer ago than everybody else. There was no technology like what we enjoy today and like what Kara can use for her classes or what Anne can use for her writing and so forth. So there was none of that. Everything was done by catalog, by phone calls and letters, actual letters. So. I had a catalog from which to choose. And because I was in the public school system and not with private schools, there was a certain you know, parameter around what we could order. And no, I was not made aware of copyright laws. I wouldn't say that seriously in college. Um, my education spans over three different universities from Michigan to Florida by way of Louisiana. And at none of those universities was uh, I in a class where they covered copyright laws. However, when I became a teacher, I can read. So I read 
the warnings, you know, on the bottom in the little tiny print. I have a habit of reading tiny print because that's what can get you in the most trouble. <laughs> so, so in the print where it always says, you know, by penalty of fine or time, as I call it, fine or time, neither of which I had any interest in. I just made sure that I read those things and that I knew that that meant you don't copy this unless because I was in public schools, I could copy if I needed extra pieces. I had 150 children. I didn't have you know, enough parts for everybody. So I could go down to the front office and I could, we didn't have copiers in our offices like a lot of band directors do now. Mm -hmm. So I would have to, on my planning period, go down and possibly stand in line for the copier to make those copies that I needed for those students. So in that respect, maybe I was lucky that there wasn't the technology that there is now because now there's so much more to have to consider. Um, I didn't need a lot of details. Like I said, I just ordered what was approved. Um, and then I always read the, the warnings, the to do's and the not to do's. Um, so as far as I was concerned, that was enough said. It's interesting you mentioned photocopying because even now, if you photocopy something, um, you have to have proof of sending back the destroyed copies in some cases. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like they have to be ripped up or shredded. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to, you know, cause sometimes like within an education of fair use, if we have uh -huh. to do an emergency or a page turn or something, but they will say on there that if you make any copy, you have to return you have it. To destroy it. They can see that you've destroyed it. Um, speaking of like the copies being returned or destroyed, can, we were contractually obligated many times through the Civic Orchestra of Jacksonville from our rentals that we did, where, um, Julie, I don't know if you remember doing this at all, or um, Cindy too, like tossing in copies of music that you printed off and from for Molly to like put it in the bin um because that was yeah. part of the contract but yeah. I have yet to see now granted we haven't ordered some music in a while but I have yet to see that we need the actual copies or like the things that you printed out to be returned back yeah. like with the program and the music mm -hmm. and all that stuff so that's a new one for even me so we are fast approaching our time. So I wanted to just do a, a quick summary of what we've discussed here today. And that is simply that the copyright laws in the US are intended to protect original compositions for the benefit of the authors and the composers. The Civic Orchestra holds two blanket licenses to enable access to a broad range of pieces for our performance. The licenses have fees, they have reporting requirements, and these are significant for a nonprofit organization like us. We're particularly grateful to Karen and to Marguerite for all their hard work in managing the licenses. Um, and Marguerite, always for her guidance in selecting mm -hmm. music that we can not only afford, but, but use to make fun and inspiring and creative uh, performances. Yeah, I'd like to thank mm -hmm. Anne and Julie as well for their informative discussions of the practical aspects of this important topic. And until next time.